Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about permutations and combinations. Consider if we had five distinct objects, like the letters A, B, C, D, and E. We might want to know how many different orders we could put the objects in. We call an ordering of objects a permutation. So for example, one permutation would be A, B, C, D, E. Another one would be if we put the letters in some different order, like B, A, C, D, E. Or maybe A, E, C, D, B, right? We can see that there's going to be lots of different ways that we can order this out. Each one of these is a permutation of the letters A, B, C, D, because it's an ordering of those objects. So one of the things we'll be working on is how can we figure out how many permutations a set of objects has? That's one of the major things we'll be learning in this lesson. The other thing we'll be working on is consider if we had that same group, A, B, C, D, E, but this time we're just going to pull three objects out of the larger group, but we don't care about order. So we're taking three out. We are choosing three objects, but this time the order of the selection doesn't matter, just which objects are selected. We call a selection of objects a combination. So for example, if we're talking about A, B, C, D, E again, we could pull out A, B, C, which notice that's equivalent to pulling out B, C, A, which is equivalent to pulling out C, A, B, which is equivalent to pulling out C, B, A, which is equivalent, and there's going to be another two as well. So it doesn't matter what order we pull them out in. All that matters is what things we have at the end, right? We don't care if we pull out cards from a deck in the order of, you know, we don't normally care what order things come out when we're talking about a selection of objects, just that they're all there. But a different one would be if we'd pulled out different letters, like for example, A, B, D. Or if we had pulled out B, uh, let me use again another different color, B, <laughs> B, D, E, right? That would be yet another different selection. So each one of these is a combination, a way of choosing letters from our group of letters. In this lesson, we're going to figure out formulas for permutations and combinations for any number of objects. These are important ideas, and they show up in a lot of different places in math, as well as a variety of other fields. Being able to talk about the permutations of objects or the combinations of objects, these are how we can choose things out. These are all really important ideas, and they show up in a lot of places. That it can be even kind of surprising how many places they'll show up. So definitely important stuff here. All right. First, we want to work on getting a permutation formula out of this. So how many ways can we arrange the letters A, B, C, D, and E? How many permutations of those letters are there? Well, whatever way we order them, we know that they're going to take up a total of five slots, right? We've got five letters, so we're going to have to place them one after another. So there's going to have to be a total of five spaces taken up by these letters. So we'll visualize this with empty boxes that are waiting to be filled. Now, consider that very first slot. One of the letters has to go there, and we have A, B, C, D, and E. So since we have five letters, there are five choices to fill that first slot. If we just look at the first slot without even worrying about the other ones, we know that if we fill the first slot first, we have, to begin with, five choices because we could choose A, B, C, D, or E. So with that in mind, we say that there are five choices for our first slot. Now, what if we're going to consider the second slot? How many choices do we have to fill that slot? Well, we used to have five objects, right? We used to have A, B, C, D, and E, but we used one of them in this first slot. We used one object on the first slot, so now we only have four objects for the second one, thus four choices. Now notice, by this logic, we never actually mentioned which object got picked, just that we used some object. So we don't have to care what object is picked. Let's really drive this home. So consider if we had A, B, C, D, and E. If we had chosen A to go into that first one, well then we would have B, C, D, and E for this box here, so we would have four possibilities for that box. But what if we had chosen a different letter to go into the first box? If instead we had chosen letter D to go into it? Well, once again, we're still going to have one, two, three, four choices, A, B, C, E. So we're going to have the same number of choices to go into that slot. So it doesn't matter which choice went into the first slot, we're going to wind up having four choices for the second slot, no matter what we chose in the first one. So we can say that there are four choices for the second slot. 
This logic is going to work for each of the slots. For every slot we go down, there will be one less choice, right? This is going to be consecutively true. So there'll be five for the first slot, and then because we just used one of them, there'll be four for the second slot, and then because we just used one of them in the second slot, there'll be three for the third slot, two for the fourth slot, and one for the fifth and final slot. So we use up one of them on each slot we work through. Now, Note that we know the number, so at this point we now know how many choices are possible for each of the slots. So we can figure out the total possible permutation. So in our first slot we have five choices, in the next one we've got four choices, three choices, two choices, one choices. Well we can think of each of these choices that we make as an event, and so our first event has five things, and the next event has four possibilities, and the next event has three possibilities, the next event has two possibilities, one possibility. So we multiply them all together, five times four times three times two times one, we get 120. So we're multiplying each of the ones for each of these slots. Now, this logic will expand to any number of objects. So for any number n of distinct objects, we can start off with this n slot. So we will have n choices for the first slot because we have n different objects to choose from. Then for the next one, we will have n minus 1 for the next slot because we just used one for the first slot, so there's now one less for the second slot. Then for the following slot, there will be n minus 2 because we just used one on the previous slot, so we've dropped down one again, and this method will continue forever until we finally get down to the nth slot here, which will only have one remaining choice because we've used everything else up by the time we get there. To figure out the total number of possible permutations, we just multiply them all together, right? We've got a first choice at n, a next choice at n minus 1, next choice at n minus 2. So to figure out everything, we just multiply them all together, and that'll tell us all of the possibilities that could come out of this. So first one was n, next one is n minus 1, next one times n minus 2, next times n minus 3, times n minus 4, blah, 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 blah. We eventually get down to times 3, times 2, times 1. Now, that's rather a lot to write out, right? So luckily, we this comes up some way, this comes up often enough that we won't actually have to write out this whole long thing every time we want to talk about it. It has its own special notation. That special notation is factorial notation. Multiplying successive positive integers is shown by factorial notation. The symbol that is just like an exclamation mark is the symbol for factorial, and it works like this. So where n is just contained in the natural numbers, any natural number n, n factorial is equal to n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3, blah, 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 until we finally get down to 1. That is, it's multiplying the number that we start with by every positive integer below that number. We say this here as n factorial, n factorial. So for example, if we have 4 factorial, then that's going to be 4 times what number is below that, 3 times what number is below that, 2 times what number is below that, 1. There's nowhere further to go down, so we have 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Same thing if we have 27 factorial, 27 times 26 times 25 times 24 times 23 times blah, 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 blah. We finally work our way down to 1. Now, one special thing here. To make certain math formulas easier to work with in the future, we just define 0 factorial equal to 1. It makes things a lot easier if we say 0 factorial is equal to 1, even though it doesn't quite make sense with this definition that we just defined here. It's not quite as natural a thing to say, but it will make things work out a lot more smoothly in the future. So just trust me on this. It makes sense to say 0 factorial equals 1. It will keep things running smoother in the future, so we just make that definition. Everything else, though, works like we'd expect. 1 factorial is just 1 times itself, so 1, 2 factorial, 2 times 1, 3 factorial, 3 times 2 times 1, and going up forever. But 0 factorial is the special thing where we just say it's equal to 1. Just have to remember that. All right, going back to permutation of objects, with this notation, factorial notation under our belts, we can now easily and succinctly write out the formula for permutation. The number of permutations of n objects, where they're all distinct objects, in other words, how many different orders we can put the objects into, is equal to n factorial. Simple as that permutation of r objects out of n. So what if we have more objects than we have slots to fit them into? For example, say we had a bag containing one of each letter on a tile. So 26 letters in the alphabet we're using. So we've got 26 tiles in this bag, and on each one of the tiles is a different letter. So there's an A in there, a B in there, a C in there, a D in there, all the way down to Z. 
So if we pull out one tile at a time and we place it down in the order that it's pulled, and we do this five times, how many words are possible? Words, of course, and that should say how with a capital how. How many words are possible? And by word, I just mean string of letters. The most of these aren't going to actually have any real meaning. So we're just saying how many different things can we make out of this? So we do this the exact same logic we did previously. How many choices do we have for the first one? Well, we have 26 choices for the first one because we are pulling from a bag of 26 letters. For the next one, there are 25 for the next one because we just used one of the letters already, so that's reduced our number of choices, so we've got 25 letters. We have 24 for the one following that. We've used one. We have 23 for the one following that. We've used one. We have 22 for that one. That means we've now put down five letters, so the total possible number of words that will come out of these five letters is 26 choices for the first one, 25. So we multiply them all together, 26 times 25 times 24 times 23 times 22. Cool, we figured it out. So the logic that we just used for that previous idea, that previous example, would work for any similar problem. So if you find that easy, that makes a lot of sense to you, go ahead and use that. But we're going to obtain our general formula by looking at things a little bit differently. So start off by considering ordering 26 objects. So this many objects here, didn't want to put down 26 squares, it's 26 squares we're pretending are there. Now, from before, we know that there are 26 factorial possible orderings, right? If we've got 26 different squares, then there are 26 factorial ways to order those squares. That's what we just figured out with permutations. However, that doesn't going to really, that's not exactly what we're looking for for that previous problem, right? We only care about the position of the first five letters. The following 21 letters, we don't care about that, right? We only care. We don't care about the last 21 letters, these letters over here, because they don't affect the thing we're looking at, right? They just stay in the bag, those last 21 letters. We are only concerned with what are the first five things to come out. So when we calculated the 26 factorial permutations for 26 letters, we were counting the order of the last 21 as well. We were counting this part here, the sort of tail, the tail of the thing. But now we need to get rid of that. We don't care about the order of that. We can think of this as we put down the letters, right? We put down our first, second, third, fourth, fifth letter, and then we decide, what the heck, I'll put down the rest of the 21 as well. But the ones that are past the edge of those first five, they just get shoved back into the bag. Only the first five wind up counting. So we don't actually wind up caring what this latter 21's order was. So how do we get rid of that order? We do it by dividing out all the ways we could order, all the possible orderings for those last 21 letters. How many ways can we order 21 letters? We can order them 21 factorial ways. So we've got 26 factorial possible total, but then we're dividing out the stuff that we don't care about, that 21 factorial for the tail this last 21 letters. So 26 factorial for the whole thing divided by 21 factorial for the bottom. Well, 26 factorial, we could rewrite that as 26 times 25 times 24 times 23 times 22 times 21 times 20 times 19, right? But since we're going to go on forever, we could also just say times 21 factorial, right? 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21 factorial, because that just says keep going down to one as well. So that will be the same thing as 26 factorial. Well, we've got 21 factorial on the bottom as well, so we can cancel them out now, which allows us to get 26 times 25 times 22, sorry, times 24 times 23 times 22, which is the exact same thing as we had previously. So it seems like this is a reasonable way to think about this. This actually makes sense. We can now extend this logic to a general point where we can use this logic to figure out any general formula for a permutation of R objects pulled from a set of N objects total. So previously, we were pulling five objects, R equals five, from a set of 26 objects, permutations of five objects from a set of 26 objects. Now, all the objects total would have n factorial for doing this in general. So n objects, n factorial permutations, total possible. So all objects together are n factorial permutations. But we don't care about all the objects. We only care about the first r objects. So we need to get rid of that stuff that we don't care about. We don't care about the latter n minus r objects. So we get rid of the ways that we can order that tail, that back n minus r because we only care about the first r, so the rest of them will be n minus r, so we do this by dividing by n minus r factorial. So previously that was 26, uh, 26 minus 5, so 21 factorial. So that gets us n factorial divided by the part that we don't care about, n minus r factorial. 
This idea comes up often enough that it has its own symbols, a little n in front of a big P and then a little r, or P of n comma r, where the n is how many objects we have total and r is how many permutations, the number of objects we're using for our permutations. So n p r or p of n comma r. Both are fine ways to show this and you also don't have to use these methods. You can also just talk about it and explain it and go through with this formula. But if we talk about it a lot, we might wind up using these symbols. So what about distinguishable permutations? So far, everything we've looked at, we've had cases where all of the objects we're rearranging are all completely distinct from one another. For example, when we were talking about the bag full of letter tiles, we only had one of each letter so we could tell the difference between each of the tiles in there. But what if they aren't going to be distinct from each other? So for example, let's consider a nice simple example. If we're going to permute the word Bob, so if the Bs are distinct, that way we have some way of telling one B from the other one, say one of them is in a color red and the other one is just in the color black, then we can tell the difference between one B and the other B. So we've got three distinct objects, which means three factorial or six possible permutations. So you can see all the permutations here. We've got all the different ways of rearranging it. But if we take away this color, if the Bs are not distinct, this number will shrink down. So notice that where we used to have Bs, it mattered if the red B or the black B came first, right? It mattered which one was the first one for those Bs. But if we swap their locations, whether it's swapping around O or they're next to each other, we're not going to be able to tell the difference between swapping their locations. So now all the times they used to be in the, the Bs were in the same location, they cancel out, they disappear. We're only left with one of them. So for example, over here we've got Bob. So over here, this Bob is now no longer distinguishable from it. BBO is now no longer distinguishable from the other BBO. And OBB is no longer distinguishable from this OBB. So we're left with only three different ways of doing it. So the order that the Bs appear in no longer matters. So if we're going to figure it out from the number of permutations, we have to cancel it out. So we started off with three factorial equal to six possible permutations of the letters B, O, B. But since we can't tell the difference between one B and the other B, it doesn't matter which order we put them down in, so we have to divide all the ways we can order our Bs. How many ways can we order our Bs? There's two Bs, so two factorial, which is just equal to two. So we divide three factorial, the total thing Thing being arranged divided by the ways that we can arrange the thing that is identical, 2 factorial. So 3 factorial over 2 factorial equals 6 over 2, which equals 3, which is the exact same thing that we got here when we actually worked it out by hand and saw each of the words. This logic will work in general. If we have a set of objects where some are not distinct from others, we take the total permutations possible if they were all distinct, then divide by how many ways the non-distinct objects can be ordered. So we divide by ways non-distinct objects can be ordered. This can be done multiple times. So let there be a set of n objects. So we've got n objects and there's various types of object in the set. In a single type, so if you are in a type, the objects are not distinct from each other. So for example, in the previous one, we had type B and type O in our previous example. Well, if you were a type B letter, there's no way to tell you from the other type B letter. If you were a type O letter, there's no way to tell you from the other O letter, but there was just the one of them. So we had type Bs and type O. So we can expand this to a general thing of N1 be the number of the objects of the first type. N2 be the number of the objects of the second type, N3, the third type, and so on until we get to however many types we have, let's say K types. So then in general, N1 plus N2 plus dot 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 up into our NK. So the number of each of our types, the number of each type added together is equal to the total number of objects. This makes sense. We had two Bs, one O, two plus one equals three, which is the total number of letters that we had in the word Bob. The number of distinguishable permutations is the number of ways that we can order our n objects, n factorial, divided by the number of ways we can order type 1 objects, the number of ways we can order type 2 objects, up until we get the number of ways we can ty order type k objects. So n factorial divided by n1 factorial times n2 factorial up until nk factorial. So the way we can order the whole thing divided by the way we can order each of the subtypes. Finally, combinations. Let's reconsider the bag containing one of each letter, so 26 in total. We'll still pull out five letters, but this time we don't care about the order of those five letters. So it doesn't matter if it goes in the way we, or we pulled it out 
or we can swap the orders and it just is all the same thing from our point of view. Order does not matter in there. Now, from our previous work, we know that there are 26 factorial over 21 factorial possibilities for those first five slots if we care about order. That's what we figured out with NPR, right? 26 for N, R equals five because we're choosing from 26 objects, we're pulling out five and we care about order. So 26 P five gets us 26 factorial divided by 26 minus five factorial or 21 factorial. So that gets us how many ways that we can have five letters at the front if we care about order, but we don't care about order. So we no longer care about the order of those first five letters. How can we get rid of it? How can we wind up letting these things move around and having it be the same from our point of view? We divide out the number of ways we can order those first five letters. So the number of ways we can order five things is five factorial. So we divide what we have for the number of ways we can pull out these first five letters with order. We divide that by five factorial. The number of ways we can have those first five letters with order is 26 factorial over 21 factorial. And then we just figured out that the number of ways we can order these first five letters is five factorial, so we divide by a further five factorial. So 26 factorial divided by five factorial times 21 factorial. So this is all of the ways to choose five letters from the bag. Choose is a special word that means that we're doing this combination thing where we don't care about the order of the objects, we just care about what came out of the bag, but not the order that they came out of the bag. Special word, choose. This logic can be generalized. So let there be a set of n objects that we want to choose from. So we've got n objects that we're pulling from, and we want to choose r objects out of it, but we do not care about order. So order is not important to us. So we're pulling out r objects from a set of n objects, but we don't care about the order that they come out of. So there are n p r, n factorial divided by n minus r, factorial ways to choose r with order. So NPR gives us the ways to choose R if we care about the order of those R objects. But we don't care about the order of those R objects, right? We don't care about order. So since we don't care about order, we have to get rid of how many ways we can order those R objects. We can do that by dividing by R factorial because R factorial tells us all the ways we can order R objects. So we divide by R factorial to get rid of the order on those first R objects. So. If there's a set of n objects, let there be a set of n objects. If you choose r of them, if you choose r of them with no regard for the order of choice, so it doesn't matter who comes first out of the bag, the number of possible ways to do this, the number of combinations we have is n factorial divided by the number of ways that we can order the choices that we're pulling out, r factorial times n minus r factorial, the number of ways we can order the things that we're not pulling out. n factorial divided by r factorial times n minus r factorial. And notice that there's a nice thing of r factorial plus n minus r comes out, sorry, r plus n minus r comes out to be n. So these two numbers here total up to n, what we started with. So they total up to the n that we started with. This idea comes up often enough that it has its own symbols. It comes up even more than the uh, permutations thing we talked about previously. So we have n c r, n r like this, where we've got these large brackets on the sides, large uh, parentheses on the sides, and n is above it, n is above r, or c of n comma r. In any of these cases, we say any of these aloud as n choose r. So we've got a set of n objects and we are choosing r out of them and choosing means we don't care about the order we pull out. All right, we're ready for our examples here. So first example, how many ways are there to order a standard deck of 52 playing cards? And then compare that number to the number of atoms that make up the earth. So how many ways are there to order a standard deck of 52 cards? Well, we can do this, start with a visual understanding of it. So we've got 52 slots that we're going to wind up putting down because we're going to place down each of these cards, right? So there's a bunch of different slots here. We work our way through all of them. Well, for our first one, we place down the first card. There are 52 choices for our first card. Then for the next card, we used up one of the choices, so there are 51 choices for the following card. Then we put down our next card, so there are 50 choices for that one because we've used up two so far. We work our way down until finally we get down to two, we get down to one. So how do we talk about this? Well, the number of total possibilities is going to be 52 times 51 times 50 times blah, 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 until we finally get down to the one. So 52 times 51 
times 50 times blah, 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 times 2 times 1. Luckily, there's that nice convenient notation, so we don't have to actually write this whole thing out. We just have 52 factorial is the number of ways to order a 52 card deck of playing cards. 52 factorial number of ways. Of course, we might not have a very good sense of how big is 52 factorial. We're not used to working with factorials that much. It gets kind of hard to know for larger numbers. So let's work it out. Of course, working it out by hand is going to be awful. So we use a calculator. We get a calculator to do this. And we're probably not even going to want to say 52 times 51 times 50 times 49. That's going to take us forever. Luckily, most calculators have a factorial button on them or some, system, some way to go through a menu so that you can get that exclamation mark symbol and use that. You work that out. You put 52, then that exclamation mark symbol. You put it into your calculator that comes out to be approximately 8 times 10 to the 67 ways to order your deck. 10 to the 67. Now notice the earth is made up by approximately 10 to the 50th atoms whereas the ways all of the ways that we can order a deck of 52 cards is 8 times 10 to the 67th ways that is a massive amount more if we were to divide the number of ways that you can order that deck by the size of the earth in atoms that would leave us with around 8 times 10 to the 17th ways, which means that in Earth, the number of atoms in Earth is one millionth, one millionth, one millionth, one millionth of one millionth of one millionth of the number of ways that you can order a deck of cards, approximately. That's crazy, right? That's an insane amount of quantities, just with this fairly small, simple thing. We wouldn't think that you could get that many possibilities out of it. These numbers get huge really, really quickly. Really interesting to think about that. You also might wind up seeing if you put a larger number, like say 100 factorial into your calculator, it will say overflow because the number is so big the calculator can't even work with it anymore. Second example, if 20 people run in a race, how many possible ways are there for runners to come in first, second, and third? So we can do this once again, visualize this with boxes. So our first box is the first place box. And then our second box is the second place box. And then our third box is the third place box. And we don't care about the fourth, fifth, sixth. We don't care about further boxes because all we were asked for is ways for first, second, and third. So how many choices are for the first box? Well, we were told there are 20 people running in the race, so 20 choices for the first box. For the second box, well, we just used one of those, so there are now 19. For the third box, we just used another, so there are now 18, which is going to mean 20 times 19 times 18 different ways. Alternatively, we could have looked at this as NPR. How can we choose R objects out of a group of N objects if we care about the order? Because we care about the order. There's a big difference between first and second, right? So we care about that. Our R in this case, our N in this case is 20 people, so 20 and P, and then our R is three people because we're looking at pulling out three people caring about order. That gives us 20 factorial divided by 20 minus three factorial. So we keep working with this. That's the same thing as 20 factorial over 20 minus three is 17 factorial. We can rewrite 20 factorial as 20 times 19 times 18 times 17 times 16 times 15. Well, 17 all the way down to one. We can also just write that as 17 factorial. And now we've got the same thing on the top and the bottom. So seven factorial on the top, seven factorial on the bottom. They cancel out. We're left with 20 times 19 times 18. So either way we work this out, whether we work this out visually with the boxes and seeing how many choices there are, or we work it out with that formula we figured out earlier for a general formula, we're going to get the same thing, which is good. 20 times 19 times 18 is 6,840 different ways for the race to end. We can have 6,840 different possibilities for the runners to come in first, second, and third if we have 20 people running in the race. Example three, how many ways are there to arrange the letters of senseless into a distinguishable word? Now, that's to say the word doesn't have to make sense. It just needs to be a single string of letters and be distinct from the other words, so different from another way of putting it. But most of these words, if not pretty much all of them, are not going to make sense. So let's work through this. How many ways, how many letter types do we have, right? Because this is types objects. This is distinguishable permutations, which we remember from before is n factorial divided by the number of our first type factorial times the number of our second type factorial up until our last type times each other factorial. So how many S's do we have? So the number of S's that we have is one, two, three, four S's total. 
the number of E's that we have is 1 E, 2 E, 3 E's total. The number of N's that we have is 1 N, that's all of our N's, 1. And the number of L's that we have is 1 L, so 1 L as well. How many does that mean total? So our total letters is 4 plus 3 plus 1 plus 1, so 7, 8, 9, which we'd also get if we counted 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So good, things make sense so far. So the total ways that we can arrange all of these letters, the total ways that we can arrange all of these letters is 9 factorial. But then we divide it by each of the ways that we can order the types of letter, because we don't care about the order the S's come in. They're all the same to us, so it doesn't matter which S comes first. So we have four S's, so four factorial times, we have three E's, three factorial times one N, one factorial times one L, one factorial. So nine factorial divided by four factorial times three factorial times one factorial times one factorial. Now, one factorial and one factorial, well, one factorial is just one, that's it, right? There's nobody, no further down to go. So one factorial is just one. So one times one, we can just get rid of them for now. So at this point, we've got nine factorial over four factorial times three factorial. We could punch that into a calculator if we wanted and it would give us the answer. But we also might want to simplify things a little bit. So nine factorial, we can break down into nine times eight times seven times six times five times four factorial divided by four factorial times three factorial. Well, we've got a four factorial here on the bottom and four factorial on top, so they cancel out. We've got nine times eight times seven times six times five on top at this point. Three factorial is three times two times one. Three times two times one is six. So we've got a six on the bottom now, so we've got the six on top and six on the bottom. They cancel out. So we're left with nine times eight times seven times five. We plug that into a calculator, we work it out, and we get 2,520 different ways that we can order the letters of senseless and still make a distinguishable word that is different from all of the other ones. That's very different than just all the ways we can order nine things, because in this case, some of the things look the exact same as the other, so we can't tell the difference. For example, if we swap this S with this S here, we can't tell the difference, right? Any S is just the same to us, so we can't tell the difference, so we have to be able to divide by the number of ways we can move around our S's, and since we had a total of four S's, we have to divide by four factorial. That's the logic going on here. And we get our answer, 2,520. Fourth example, given a standard deck of 52 playing cards, how many ways are there to choose five cards from the deck? Notice it said choose, and choose means order does not matter. So, how does choose work? If it's 52, choose five things out. Alternatively, we could write it this way with the large parentheses and the 52 choose five, where the number that we're pulling out of is above the number of things we're pulling out. So 52 choose five. Well, we're choosing five cards. How many ways are there to pull out five cards if we don't care about the order from 52? So, choose works. The number of things, 52 factorial, divided by the number of things that we are pulling out times 52, the whole number of things, minus the number of things we're pulling out factorial. So that gets us 52 factorial over 5 factorial times 47 factorial, because 52 minus 5 is 47. So we can rewrite 52 factorial as 52 times 51 times 50 times 49 times uh, 48 times 47 factorial. So now we've got a 47 factorial on the bottom and on the top, five factorial here, 47 factorial here, cancel, cancel. So we have 52 times 51 times 50 times 49 times 48 divided by five factorial. Five factorial comes out to be 120, but it doesn't matter. We can plug all this into a calculator one way or the other. We work it out in our calculator and we get 2,598,960 different ways that we can pull out five cards from the deck, and that's not including order. So that means 2,598,960 five card hands that are distinct from each other. So that's a whole lot of possibilities in something that seems very small to begin with. We managed to get these very large numbers of possibilities. Possibility grows at this incredibly fast rate. 
Fifth example, how many two-person relationships are possible within a class of 30 people? So the first thing to think about is, what does it mean to have a two-person relationship, right? What does a two-person relationship in a group of people mean? Well, let's think about this. So if we've got some person here, we've got blue man, we've got red man, we've got green man. What does a relationship between any of these people look like? Well, relationship is red man and blue man talking to each other, or blue man and green man talking to each other, or green man and red man talking to each other. So that's a two-person relationship is how these connections are like this. So what we're looking at is how many, how is it possible to pull out these two people linked together, or these two people linked together, or these two people linked together. So in another way, it's a way of asking how many ways is it possible to pull out two people from the group because we pull them out and that's a relationship. We pull out a different two people and that's a relationship, right? So you pull out some person and some other person, that's a relationship between them. That is a two-person relationship. Even if they don't know each other, that's just their relationship is not knowing each other. So if we've got a group of 30 people, then that means that we are pulling from a group of 30 people, we are pulling out two people at a time. A two-person relationship is pulling out two people and putting them next to each other. So 30 choose two. 30 factorial, the total number factorial, divided by the number that we're pulling out factorial times the number that we have total minus the number we're pulling out factorial. So 30 factorial over 2 factorial times 30 minus 2 factorial. Keep working on that. We've got 30 factorial over 2 factorial times 28 factorial. We can rewrite the top as 30 times 29 times 28 factorial divided by 2 factorial times 28 factorial. 28 factorial on the top and the bottom, they cancel each other out. 2 factorial, well, 2 factorial is just 2 times 1, so that's just 2. So on the top, we still have 30 times 29. And on the bottom, we have 2 times 1, or 2. And 30 divided by 2 is 15, so we've got 15 times 29. 15 times 29 comes out to 435 different possible relationships between the people in this class, which is, once again, a fairly large number for not that many people. Only 30 people in a classroom give us 435 different two-person connections between that. It's 435 different possible relationships you can examine, which is a really large number that grows out very quickly. Final example, example six, a group of 50 students are going to be assigned to playing four different sports. There are eight open slots in badminton, 13 in football, 17 in baseball, and 12 in volleyball. Notice that makes a total of 50 slots. How many ways can the students be assigned? So we're gonna look at this in two different ways. The first way we're gonna look at it is through the idea of choice. We're going to make different choices to begin with. So we start off and let's work on badminton first. We have eight open slots for badminton. So what we're looking at is how many ways are there to choose eight players for the badminton group? So 50 students, so if we've got 50 students we're choosing from, how can we choose 50 choose eight? is all the ways we can choose our badminton group. Next up, let's work on the football group. So football group, but it's not going to be 50 choose 13 because how many people did we, do we have at this point? Well, we just did badminton, right? We are now reduced by the eight students we put into the badminton team. So we don't have them to work with anymore. So it's 50 minus eight students is how many people are left. So 50 minus eight is 42. So there are now 42 students left for looking for how we're going to put football positions around. So 42 choose 13 is how many we can have for football at this point. That's all the choices for football after we've already done the choices for badminton. Next, let's look at how many we can put into baseball. So once again, we have to reduce how many the student pool that's left by how many people we've already put in for other things. We already had 13 go into football from 42. So 42 minus 30, 13 becomes 29. And now we are choosing 17 for baseball. And finally, 12 for volleyball. 29 minus 17 means we have 12 students left, and of course, every single one of them is automatically going to be chosen for volleyball. 12 students, choosing 12 students out of them, well, every one of them is going to have to go into volleyball because they're the group left over. If we work this out, you know, with what these mean mathematically, 50 choose 8 is 50 factorial over 8 factorial times 50 minus 8, so 42 factorial. Next up, times 42 factorial divided by uh, 13 factorial times 42 minus 13 factorial, so that comes out to be 29 factorial. 
Next one is times 29 factorial, what we're choosing out of, divided by 17 factorial, how many we're choosing out, 29 minus 17, 12 factorial, times 12 factorial, divided by 12 factorial, times zero factorial, 12 minus 12 gets a zero. So that's an important reason, right there we see why we define zero factorial, Remember, zero factorial equals one. We just defined that, and that's so we don't have things like dividing by zero happen over here, so that zero factorial just cancels out nicely. Now notice at this point, we've got 42 factorial on the bottom here, and 42 factorial up here, so they cancel each other. Same thing, 29 factorial, 29 factorial, they cancel, 12 factorial, 12 factorial, they cancel. So that leaves us, in the end, 50 factorial on the top, divided by eight factorial, times 13 factorial, uh, times the 17 factorial times the 12 factorial. So that is the total number of ways that we can put this out for our for our uh, all of our team assignments. Now notice that is so that is an exact perfect answer. That is correct, but it's not a number. So we might want to use a calculator to get an approximate number. So we'd go into our calculator, find the uh, find the factorial button, that exclamation mark, somewhere in our menus. We'll be able to figure it out, put it down that way, and we'll be able to get the answer. So that's what it comes out to be. We'll have to work through a calculator to get an, ex to get an approximate answer, but that's the precise answer. So this is the answer right here. Now, alternatively, we could have done this in a totally different way. We could have also done this through arrangement. Now, the arrangement way is a little bit more complicated to think through, I think. But it works faster, and I think it's a little sa a little more satisfying. But the choice method works great. If it makes sense and this arrangement one doesn't quite make sense, use the choice method. Whatever makes most sense to you is the way you want to work. But the arrangement method, you might find that this makes sense, and it will go even faster. So the way we have to think about this first is we can think about this as putting all 50 students in a line. So we line them up alphabetically, whatever. We line up the 50 students, and then we keep them there. We don't let them move. They just stay in their position. So we have lined up students there. Next, we think of badminton, football, baseball, volleyball as cards. So there is a badminton card, and we have a total of eight badminton cards. And then there are, let's make that a BD, because it's kind of hard to tell the difference between badminton and baseball if they both have that. So BD, BD are badminton cards. And then we've got our football cards. How many football cards do we have? Well, we've got 13 football cards. How many baseball cards do we have? Well, we've got 17 baseball cards. And then we've got how many volleyball cards we've got? We've got 12 volleyball cards. So we can think of this as these cards. And now the question is, how can we hand these cards out to the students? So if we think of our students as just standing there little boxes waiting to receive their cards. There's a total of 50 things, and then the question is, how can we place these cards in? Well, it's a question of how can we arrange these cards and hand them over to those boxes, right? We arrange the cards in some line, and then we hand it over to the line of students waiting there. So how many ways are there to arrange this set of cards? Well, we've got a total of 50 cards, right? This comes out to 50 total. So we have 50 factorial divided by, what are we going to divide by? Well, how many ways can we arrange the badminton cards? It doesn't matter if you get the first badminton card, or the second badminton card, or the last badminton card. They all mean the same thing. Go on to the badminton team. So it doesn't matter which way we arrange our badmintons, so we divide by 8 factorial, because the arrangement of our badminton cards doesn't matter. <coughs> Next up, we divide by 13 factorial, all the ways that we can arrange our football cards. Then we divide by 17 factorial, all the ways we can arrange our baseball cards. And then finally, we divide by 12 factorial, all the ways we can arrange our volleyball cards. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing distinguishable permutations of our cards, all the ways that we can have distinguishable permutations of these 50 assignment cards. So we can look at it as choosing students for the teams, but we can also look at it as arranging, this, arranging cards that we then hand over to the line of students who just waits there. So this also winds up getting us the answer, and notice they are the exact same thing. So both ways are equivalent, they get us to the same thing, which is good, that's what we'd hope for. If we work this out with a calculator, we wind up getting that it comes out to approximately the ridiculously large 7.1 times 10 to the 26th ways that we can arrange 
putting our students into these teams. That is a ridiculously large number considering we're just putting 50 students into four teams. It's amazing how fast these things get when we're working in combinatorics, when we're working with permutations and combinations. Pretty cool. All right, so that does it for this lesson. Next lesson, we'll see how we can apply this stuff to probability and how we can use all, all of our work here to get an idea of how things, how likely is a given event to happen. All right, we'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.